Hi uh, everyone, morning, start of another week. It's uh, 8th of April. Um, so not a full week last week, as you know, it was in the US. We had uh, our Easter bank holiday last Monday, along with the rest of Europe. The US was open, so it was a full week last week. Uh, so we have got um, some interesting data out this week, uh, an important week for European markets. We've got the European Central Bank policy decision. So what we mean by that, any interest rate decisions, whether it be from the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, which is the US Central Bank, or indeed our own Monetary Policy Committee here in the UK, that has a big effect on our markets. So we are um, we follow them very closely. Yeah, uh, Two other central bank policy meetings as well uh, in New Zealand and Canada. So the Reserve Bank of New Zealand or RBNZ, Bank of Canada or BOC. So we'll be uh, looking at them. And also minutes from the last Federal Reserve meeting, the last FMC meeting, that would be really interesting as well. Anyway, there we go. Paul, morning to you. Uh, Alberto, uh, Virginia, David, Owen, morning. Hi to you. Um, Right. What, what I'll do before going on to review what's actually happening uh, this week in the markets and these, the data and events, let's just have a quick look at what happened last week. Not a great week for stocks. And I hear you all saying, God, about time. Well, US indices, I think looking at it, endured, I think, one of their worst weeks. Certainly. Uh, gosh, yeah. Probably since December. Uh, end of 2023, I'd say. Uh, the reasons, uh, down to investors' concern, um, obviously uh, about the prospects of rate cuts. Um, we talk about it every week, really, about when is the Federal Reserve going to be cutting rates? Uh, you know, at the beginning of this year, we had seven rate cuts uh, factored in uh, when we looked at this, um, you know, the uh, CME FedWatch tool. Wow, that really has changed. Uh, oil spiked last week uh, last thursday that was one of the reasons why i left it on so you can see oil absolutely hoofing it on thursday um got yeah got up to sort of 91 bucks i thought it was 92 actually but um it got up to 91 and a half on friday um that didn't help expectation for interest rates either uh, certainly for the rate cut in june uh, that is looking less likely now it's still 50 50 but wow you know in in in, a, in the space of a month that's gone from like a 75 percent probability to just 50 percent probability why do we talk about interest rates all the time it's basically because interest rates affect everything we do everything you do uh if you don't if you're not a borrower you're probably a saver and if you're uh, younger you're probably a borrower as well and interest rates affect your costs whether it be a mortgage which is our lar largest loan or debt that we have in our lifetime but we have car loans we have loans for hard purchase all sorts of things so these have a big effect on our lives and that's why we want to know what's happening with interest rates because it has a direct effect on consumer spending and a direct effect on the economy Okay, uh, so yeah, last week, I guess, uh, Paul, yeah, big pullback in on, it's not really a big pullback, Paul, but it, we were all expecting some sort of retaliation from Iran following that attack on their consulate in Damascus. And I sort of think the longer that doesn't happen, the more some of the heat will be taken out of the oil market, I guess. So yeah, it is a pullback um, and it gapped lower this morning and has gone down and then rebounded. But uh, I would have said this, the likelihood is if, if there is no uh, Iranian, obviously obvious Iranian uh, retaliation, then I suspect crude might give back further gains, but uh, notwithstanding other things that can affect it, of course. So last week, markets were a little bit, uh, Alberta, by the way, it wasn't their consulate, it was next door. Ah, oh, right. Gosh, you didn't know that. Didn't help, but, uh, but I think, didn't it destroy the Iranian consulate? Whatever it did, it destroyed or it killed uh, some revolutionary guards, some high-ranking revolutionary guards, which, yeah, uh, sort of has the same effect, doesn't it, Alberto? But uh, I take your point. I didn't know that, actually. Um, 
lower the interest rates the better for trading or doesn't matter uh lower interest rates we, we as traders we like a bit of volatility coming so it, it, it's like sailing a, di a, a dinghy or a, or a sailing yacht uh, we like a bit of wind but we don't want too much wind we need a bit of volatility that's for sure sometimes traders are all, often complain oh there's either too little volatility or too much volatility but volatility is more enhanced at the moment and it makes trading more interesting may not make it as much as profitable time will tell but yeah we do um interest rates the path of interest rates where they are really when they were all crushed at sort of 0.1 percent that didn't help trading at all because currencies just died a death kevin so by having higher interest rates, varying interest rates from one country to another helps with uh, currency volatility, which is uh, what we feed off, right? uh, helps us earn our money. Uh, anyway, last week we're talking about the markets, uh, equity markets. We had this PCE data that was released on Good Friday, all a bit weird because no markets were open. It's a wonder that they released the data when the markets were closed. Very strange. Anyway, it's the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, and it came in as expected. Uh, but it was, I think, there was a, a sort of quite a strong consumer spending reading, which really caught the eye, uh, and that exceeded all expectations. And 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 after that data on Good Friday, which then fed into last week's early move, early early last week moves, that prompted Jay Powell, who's chair of the Federal Reserve, to say that the release was sort of in line with expectations. And he also reiterated that his rate setting committee, the FMC, does not need to rush to cut interest rates. That's not what we want to hear. Or that's not what people want to hear who uh, have got a vested interest in having a lower financing costs. Anyway, by close of uh, Wednesday, uh, the S&P had already lost all of the gains from the previous week anyway. And then by Thursday, following this Israeli attack on, well, uh, the building next door to the Iranian consulate in Damascus, uh, oil rose sharply. Reason being, obviously, in, in anticipation of some sort of Iranian uh, retaliation, uh, and a widening in the Israel-Hamas conflict in the Gaza Strip. Um, and in reaction to the sudden surge in oil prices, the US uh, and other international indices, so it wasn't just uh, the NASDAQ and the S&P, but we had you know, the Euro stocks, the uh, FTSE 100, all falling just under 1%. But in the US, the S&P fell 1.2% on the day and the NASDAQ 1.7%. So these are sharp moves. And obviously, the implication of the rising crude prices above 90 bucks brings into focus that $100 level, which a lot of, a lot of economists talk about as some sort of target or a bench mark or a, some sort of like critical level. It's not, it's just a number. And it sometimes when you do have these sort of psychological numbers the market forces its way there and then falls off dramatically anyway um yeah it's possible um or probable now in the wake of the middle east tensions which i guess if they don't de-escalate soon could affect oil supply and i think this is also against a, a you know a backdrop of a recent forecasts of higher global demand in oil which is outpacing uh, supply uh, of course, you know, a price of $100 a barrel could probably dampen down demand, but oil traders, they still remain nervous. They really do. And I got a feeling that even if the tensions in the Middle East do ratchet lower, I'm not sure you'll see oil come off that much because of the increase in demand. Yeah. Uh, metal's still going mad too. Yeah, Stuart, aren't they just precious metals? I'll get onto that in a second, but... Uh, Go just nuts, absolutely nuts. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this is all fed through to forward rate expectations. We've already had a look at this. You probably know the deal here. So the May, um, the next meeting is on May, May the uh, the twenty fourth. We're not at no first of May. Not that's the first of May, twenty twenty four. Sorry, the beginning of May. Uh, there is there's a five percent probability of a rate cut. It ain't happening. It's not. There is no rate cut. The first rate cut was almost a shoe in in June. And now when you look at June, 
gosh, there's a 51.6% probability that rates won't be cut. Uh, you contrast this with one month ago, when you look down here, you know, a month ago, there was a only a 26% probability of rates remaining unchanged. That really has changed quite dramatically. Um, and since, you know, the shift since the start of the year is even more remarkable, as I said. Do you remember seven rate cuts? Now it's two or three, possibly only two by year end. Uh, yeah, weird. Um, Non-farm employment change, do you remember? That's that key data release and that's something that the markets follow quite closely. Uh, that came out um, last week. There we go, uh, non-farm employment change. This curiously named employment report, uh, it's called non-farm. They, they don't include the farm sector because it's seasonal and volatile. So it rather clumsily gets called um, non-farm employment change. I don't know, understand why they don't use the word core. They use core and everything else. Um, anyway, um, the data released Friday had a direct, that, that has a direct impact on Federal Reserve policy because the Federal Reserve have, has got full employment as one of their two mandates. They've got to maintain price stability, but they've got to foster full employment. That's a task and a half. Anyway, so that's the reason why the market looks at the employment numbers. That's why non-farm employment chains is expected. Anyway, it came in stronger than forecast on from virtually all um, predictions. 303,000 new jobs. It's huge. It really is for an economy that was supposed to be slowing down, for an economy that needed interest rate cuts at the beginning of the year. No, expecting 212 new, thousand, new jobs of 303,000. And that really sort of implies that the US economy is growing faster than the Federal Reserve was anticipating. And in response, interest rates firmed up. Yeah. <laughs> Paul says, glad the forecast was nearly spot on. Yeah, aren't they just? It's just the way of it, Paul. It's, it's economists. <laughs> economists damn lies and statistics that they're like weather people they either all get it right or all get it wrong most were part-time though i read <laughs> part-time economists or part-time jobs <laughs> well yeah i mean whatever whichever way you look at it they're getting yeah exactly uh, i find it a bit amusing as well but it it provides us as traders well do they massage the numbers? Not really. If you think about it, the Bureau of Labor Statistics collating this data is huge. 330 million, 340 million people in the US, and they collate this data by the first Friday of the new month. And that tells us what was happening the previous month. So when this data was released on the 5th of April, it was telling us about March. Yeah, I don't think they massage their number. I just think they it's a bit like the GDP data. They just can't get it all in in time and they use they extrapolate from the data they've got. But that's why it's really important to always look at the revisions. Now, the revision last month to last month's number was hardly anything. But the one from the previous month, do you remember when we had that blowout reading in January for December? This this. Uh, revision is hardly anything, but it's worth following because there are revisions. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that was equities. So uh, yeah, just on the week, um, the Dow was down 853, the S&P 46, which is just under 1%, the Nasdaq down 144, down 0.8%. And you're probably thinking, well, after those big sell-offs on Friday, why did the market rally on, uh, sorry, on Thursday? Why did the market rally on Friday? It was sort of, wow, the economy is doing well. Yeah, and we know there are going to be three rate cuts, but it's not so bad. Even with oil prices going up, our economy, the US economy, is doing pretty good. Uh, and that's why uh, equities uh, rallied on Friday. Uh, so nothing, not as bad as what it was looking like on Thursday uh, evening. Uh, dollar, very quickly, just that's the US dollar. Uh, in the wake of a strong uh, employment report that we saw on um, uh, Friday, 
you'd think the dollar would end on a pretty strong note. Um, but by close, the US dollar really only posted marginal gains. And I, I, I sort of got a feeling that maybe it's the looming ECB rate decision this Thursday that may have held back some traders from pushing the US dollar much higher ahead of this key policy meeting. I'm not sure. Uh, but overall, you know, it managed to sort of stop the rot from earlier on in the week anyway. Um, the dollar was looking particularly shaky uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. Japanese yen's interesting, isn't it? It's uh, we're all waiting for some sort of clarity or clarification from the Bank of Japan on their next uh, rate move because uh, it, it's the markets just aren't convinced that they've totally given up on their uh, ultra loose policy, partly because inflation is falling dramatically. So, yeah. Uh, okay, on to commodities. Uh, gold, yeah, yeah, we better deal with gold. The dreaded gold, uh, yeah. Um, Stuart, you're right. They are going mad. Uh, jumped uh, Thursday, gold jumped Thursday. Uh, another record high. Just, it's all record highs now. We're in, we're in clear air as they call it. Um, gold cited as a hedge against inflation, and with inflation numbers not looking great in the U.S., uh, with the prospect of interest rates not coming down, you think would be a drag on gold. You'd think that um, uh, rates remaining where they are would prevent the gold gold going much higher. You'd think that the, the, the strength in the dollar would have stopped gold going high. But no, it's a lightning rod for a hedge against inflation and also for global angst, where there is turmoil or global macro events that attracts it. I think underlying there's been some big central bank buyings. Stuart, you hit the nail on the head. We only know they report very much in arrears, but the, the, the People's Bank of China had been a monster buyer of gold, monster buyer. Uh, and that's uh, pushing uh, gold into record territory. Even as we speak today, it's made new highs again. Uh, yeah, it is a climb, Kevin. It's extraordinary. Um, it's about three hundred. Yeah, it's about three hundred bucks higher since the beginning of March. So that's well, that's a rise of fifteen percent. I don't need a calculator to work that one out. And it's one of the biggest gains, really. If you look at, I think you've got to go back to April twenty twenty. That was as the effects of the pandemic started to uh, be felt and and uh, gold, you know, attracted the uh, global angst uh, trade. Uh, David, we're keeping, we're, we keep being told that USA and the rest of the West is deeply in debt and a reckoning is due sooner or later, public and private sectors. David, I, this is, it gets talked about all the time, but the problem is, the question is not the size of the debt, it's to, to do with the sustainability of that debt. And, you know, I was speaking to a mate of mine as we went off to watch the rugby at Northampton Saints yesterday uh, morning about debt and uh, interest rates and stuff and the way that governments do waste money. But the fact of the matter is they've got a limit, an unlimited supply of capital if they need it. They just tax us more. Uh, yes, Neil, uh, China are buying physical gold in huge quantities. That's right. Not just the Chinese central bank. There are other central banks as well. Those that want to de-dollarize the global economy are uh, buying gold significant quantities. Yeah. OK, let's get on to what's happening. That's what we wanted to talk about. Um, as Stuart said, this uh, this is the important bit, working out what's going to affect the markets we trade. Uh, let's get on to the right week. Okay, as I said at the beginning, um, an important week for our European markets here with the European Central Bank policy meeting and um, a potential change in interest rates, which is not likely, by the way. Uh, we've also got two other central banks I mentioned, uh, New Zealand and Canada. We've got US and China inflation readings, and then minutes from the last Federal Open Market Committee meeting. That was the one held on the 20th of March. So we kick off the week with nothing. There's no data on events Monday or Tuesday. It happens like that. 
Um, last week was quite an important week, although we hadn't didn't have a workshop on last Monday because it was a bank holiday, but uh, last week was a key week with the non-farm employment change. Um, this week, it just happens there's a bit of a dearth of data. Tuesday, actually, I, I, I was looking at the um, UK economy, and we've got something called the BRC, British uh, Sales Monitor. This is from the British Retail Consortium, and it reports on retail sales, not surprisingly, uh, which really continue to struggle. And I think with no sort of sign of settled weather, and I think it's been affecting Europe as well, uh, which would encourage shoppers back into the shops and it's it's something that is a worry because it will hit the GDP data and we're going to see the effects of that um, uh, on Friday with the release of our monthly uh, GDP data here in the UK. Anyway, on to Wednesday, um, our first policy meeting, the RBNZ, that's the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, no change expected there. Um, but any New Zealand pairs, any with an NZD in a pair that you're trading, that will be particularly sensitive to the news overnight. It happens at three o'clock in the morning. You'll wake up on Wednesday morning to feel the effects. We then have one of the more important, if the most important um, um, data of the week, which is the US uh, inflation reading, the Consumer Price Index, CPI inflation, uh, the headline and core CPI rates, that's these two here, expected to be up 0.3%, and that's following 0.4% uh, increases in February. The annualized rate, these are monthly rates, the annualized rate is at 3.4%, up from 3. Point, so it is expected 3.4%, up from 3.2%. Uh, and that's, believe it or not, that's back to levels that it was at the end of last year. So it's not plain sailing in the US. The uh, in core inflation is proving stickier than expected um, and that does affect um, Fed policy and that's the reason why, the, well does the US economy need interest rates cut? If it's doing well enough and inflation is remaining sticky, it shouldn't be having, you know, the Fed should not be cutting interest rates or nothing, nothing like was expected at the beginning of the year, that's for sure. Uh, we also uh, have uh, the Bank of Canada's uh, policy meeting, uh, no change expected there. So the, the sensitive one here will obviously be the, the CAD, the Canadian dollar. Any pairs with the Canadian dollar? Yep, and just be careful. Make a note in your diary, 2.45 on Wednesday afternoon. And then in Wednesday evening, we've got the FOMC meeting minutes. I find it a bit strange that it takes them more than two weeks to prepare the minutes to a meeting. Uh, you know, when the Monetary Policy Committee meet here in the UK and you, the European Central Bank, they release their minutes with their statement. It's it's almost like the Fed are wanting to, I don't know, adjust their minutes, but the minutes are the minutes, aren't they? You can't change what's discussed in the meeting. Anyway, um, we get that um, from the 20th of March when rates were kept unchanged, if you remember. You know, and it gives us an insight into the Fed thinking that will affect the timing of future rate cuts. So as a result, oops, uh, as a result, um, uh, it will affect the dollar and uh, dollar assets will be sensitive uh, to uh, uh, to that release at uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, we then go to Thursday. We've got some Chinese um, inflation data and producer price data. I, I like looking at this because there's an amazing sort of split between the West and China. Their inflation rate, they've been, they had deflation. It was only last month that inflation went above zero to plus 0.7 percent and when you look at it here you can see they've been really struggling why is that a problem i hear you th saying in low inflation is good isn't it well high inflation is bad but you need some inflation you need the ability to raise prices if you're running a business manufacturing staplers um he said looking at his stapler on the desk you need the ability to know that you can increase the price, which helps you invest in your business. Deflation, not good. And we're not really seeing much recovery either here because it's expected to come in plus 0.4%. It's still a little bit of inflation, but the worry 
for the markets is this thing called the PPI, the producer price index. That tells us the cost of goods and services going into production. And if those costs are falling, the likelihood is that there are very, there's hardly any sign of any price pressure that could push inflation higher in the months to come. So uh, not very helpful, really, I'm afraid. Not not very good news, I should say, for the uh, Chinese um, economy. Uh, then we get on to the uh, one of the main events of the week. We've already discussed it a little bit. So that's the European uh, ECB, the European Central Bank Policy Meeting, interest rate decision, no change expected. And I hear you thinking, well, that's not very interesting, is it? Another unchanged. Uh, Kevin, will these countries ever pay off then? Uh, sorry, I've read that one. Apologies. Uh, yep. Yep. No, the ECB rate decision, even if it's unchanged, who's asked that question? Paul. Even if it's unchanged, it affects our markets because we would like to hear what the European Central Bank what their thinking is behind what their rate decision is. Sure, if they do suddenly cut rates where the market is expecting no cut, as we are expecting on Thursday, then if there was a cut, the euro would fall out of bed, likely. Anyway, but we don't expect that to happen. Uh, the European Central Bank are unlikely to uh, um, upset the markets in that way. Surely falling input prices may be due to improved productivity, says David. Uh, it can be, you're right, but mo more, more likely it is down to, uh, okay, it can be. I'm not saying that's the problem. The problem is if input prices are falling, whether it's down to commodity prices falling or improvement in productivity, it does not help producers charge more money for their goods and their services. That's the problem. Um, anyway, so interest rates, uh, read really the um, ECB. Uh, we're expecting a cut in the June meeting. That's what the forward rates uh, are saying. And any news that implies a change in this expectation in the uh, um, press conference, for example, that uh, follows the uh, meeting at 145, that could push the euro higher. Uh, the swaps market, the forward, the effect of the forward interest rate contracts, have been have been uh, implying total cuts of 0.9% priced in this year. So 0.9% were the first cut in June. It's sort of what we're expecting here in the UK in a way. I think we're expecting our first rate cut. It was August, but now they pushed it forward. Um, anyway, remember, it's continually changing daily, literally daily. Anyway, there's a press conference following an announcement, and that's when uh, the euro and euro assets could uh, see a bit of volatility. So uh, watch out for that one. And then we have producer price index uh, and this is the what we've already been discussing that's the cost of goods and services going into production it is a forerunner of future inflation or deflation if you're in china headline and core rates you know are really expected to remain in check so there's no real price pressure feeding through the system at the moment so i mean it could be that obviously a spike in oil prices that we're seeing if it got out of hand that would directly impact inflation regardless of what the ppi was saying so um stuff can change of course it can yeah we're just wanting to know what's going to affect the markets we're trading we're not trying to read too much into the tea leaves we just want to know which ones do we look out for uh, and there's a good one here for the uk markets uh, gdp reading the UK was in a technical recession in Q4 last year. Uh, that was the second quarter of negative growth. Um, only marginal uh, by minus 0.1 or whatever it was. Uh, so this is the reading, um, the monthly reading. We only ever used to have quarterly readings, but we now get monthly and quarterly readings. This reading is for February. Yep, only February. And you think, well, why? what about March? Well, it takes them quite a, a while to collate. The Office of National Statistics has to collate the data on all the value of all the goods and services produced in the UK. It's a big number and it's a lot of calculating. Anyway, they're saying that growth 
it's slowing a little bit from January, which wasn't much anyway, plus 0.1%. Any negative number would be really seized on, and you can see sterling really succumb uh, if that happened. And then, end of the week, we've got the preliminary uh, reading of the University of Michigan consumer sentiment. I can only assume the numbers are going to remain really quite positive, but not surprising, really, given the state of the strong employment market in the US and also what the US markets have done this year. Extraordinary. Uh, Paul, the number of country elections are putting pressure on cuts government want good news especially especially here you're right Paul you're spot on that's that's affecting Fed policy ahead of the November presidential election in the states they know when their election is we don't know when ours is it can be any time well it has to be by November doesn't it but yeah you're you're right um, it is this is the year of demo democratic elections this is some more democratic than others, Iran, Russia, not so democratic, Turkey, a lot more democratic. So, yeah, interesting. Um, this is what adds grist to the mill. We like all of this. This is what gives color. This is what gives us volatility. Markets don't go anywhere in a straight line. And it's reading the, that price action that enables us to do what we do. Uh, yeah, long may it continue. Good. Uh, thanks very much for listening. It's 23 minutes past. I think I've, run, I've done my time. Um, listen, have a good rest of the week. I hope uh, it all goes well. Um, it's a full week uh, uh, after the Easter break last week, so uh, plenty of plenty to get our teeth into. Uh, we will catch up again next Monday. Yep. All the best, everyone, and have a good rest of the week. Yeah. Bye for now. <laughs>